for um thank you all so much for uh, making time to join us today for our open forum discussion and um I really appreciate you spending the uh, next hour or so of our time together uh, listening to two experts talk about such an important topic. So Amy, I'll let you um, have the pleasure of doing the introductions. Yeah, um, I also wanted to pass on thanks to everyone. I know this is a hectic time of the semester and I appreciate the time it took to, to come here today. Um, so on behalf of the Jedi Committee, thank you and thank you Linda and the FSAC for um, allowing us this time to talk about this important topic. Um, we're joined here by Rebecca Rotundo and Michelle Connolly, who are going to enlighten us and um, give us some, I, I think, heady thoughts to take us into the summer as we um, you know, think about what, how we're gonna um, structure our time and energy and thoughts for the um, upcoming academic year. And I'm actually gonna allow, allow each of them to provide whatever sort of introduction. I always find it weird to instill, to, to, to introduce people when they're right there and they can probably tell you better who they are than I can. So welcome everyone, thank you. That awkward third person speaking about somebody who's standing right next to you thing, it's uh, just hoping you're getting it right. Um, hi everybody, I am Rebecca Rotundo. I'm the Assistant Director of Learning Spaces at the Center of Educational Innovation. And I'm here with my colleague, uh, Michelle Connolly. Michelle would like to introduce herself. I'm going to try and do this quickly because evidently my dog is barking outside the door. So <laughs> my name is right, always, always perfect timing, right? Uh, I am Michelle Connolly, as Rebecca mentioned, and I'm one of the learning designers, I apologize, here at the Center for Educational Innovation. Um, I work with all sorts of faculty and um, kind of have a real interest in inclusive learning and spaces. Mm -hmm. Um, so to be upfront, we are not um, we are not accessibility specialists. That's a different department, but we are constantly working with you know all kinds of faculty, all kinds of students, and staff also in physical man managing and developing physical and digital spaces. So we are always having this conversation. But I do not want to present myself as any sort of um, accessibility specialist because that's a whole other world of training um, and development that we don't do, but we are, you know, it is always a part of our conversations every day that we have. Um, so today we're going to talk about cultivating inclusive practices and spaces. And we have to tell you there, there was so much conversation about what that means, what, what would be useful, who we wanna include in these conversations, how we wanna approach this material, because honestly, this is like an entire field of study and we cannot give you everything you need or even a part of what you need in an hour. But what we're hoping to do is sort of get you thinking about some low hanging inclusive practices and maybe understanding why we need to start incorporating them into our everyday practice and the motivation and how it'll benefit sort of everyone around us and not just a select few. That being said, I'm going to try and present. Let's see if I can present from my PowerPoint. <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and share one second here. All right, great. That worked. I love doing this because I don't have to switch back and forth from my slide and you guys don't have to, to see me. Um, it, it, it makes things a little bit easier. Um, if you are uncomfortable with having your screen on or, or you're just stressed out or you just don't wanna participate, feel free to turn it off. We just want you guys to feel comfortable and participate however you are, um, you're able right now mentally, especially if you're coming out of meetings. Um, you can throw questions into the chat. Michelle will be monitoring the chat. Um, if it's particularly relevant, you can raise your hand. I have no problem with that. Um, we have about, we have a lot of slides to go through, so there's some that I'm going to kind of skip over, but please stop me if you want to get engaged in a deeper conversation about any of the topics and stuff that comes up. All right, um, first we'd like to begin by acknowledging the land in which the University of Buffalo operates, uh, which is a territory of the Seneca Nation, the member of the um, Haudenosaunee, I've been practicing Haudenosaunee, um, Six Nations Confederacy, 
This territory is covered by the Dish with One Spoon Treaty of Peace and Friendship, a pledge to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. It's also covered by the 1794 Treaty of the Canandaga between the United States government and the Six Nations Confederacy, which further affirmed the Haudenosaunee land rights and sovereignty in the state of New York. Today, this region is still home to the Haudenosaunee people and we're grateful for, this, grateful for the opportunity to live, work and share ideas in this territory. Uh, quickly, what we're going to be covering to the best of our abilities. We're gonna discuss the meaning of inclusivity and some vocabulary words that are often sort of you hear as part of these conversations to make sure everybody's really clear on what we mean when we say what we say. Um, we're gonna reflect on the needs of all members of the School of Nursing community. So this isn't going to be just for faculty and students. Um, there's a huge community in the School of Nursing and there are many different people in it with many different needs. And then we're gonna talk about approaches that extend beyond the needs of the classrooms. We picked approaches though that are also appropriate for classroom and faculty student interaction. So these are translatable from sort of staff, faculty, students, classroom, office, everything. Terminology, all right. So diversity is about the variations of different characteristics of people. Um, we often talk about diversity when it comes to race or class um, or culture, but it can also be, it can be anything that shapes our identity that makes us unique. Um, that is the big umbrella of diversity. Um, equity is the next one here. Equity is ensuring, are provi ensuring systems are providing support each student needs to be successful. And in the next slide, I'm going to get and then a couple more slides, and we're gonna talk about equity versus equality versus justice and sort of the, the definitions of those so we, we are clear on what we're talking about. Equity and equality are get mixed up a lot. They're very close in my brain. Inclusion is simply um, accepting and including all the learners in the community and staff and peers and colleagues. And accessibility is, is what we do to meet the needs of people from a variety of backgrounds, abilities, and learning styles. All right, so I like this slide, this, these slides a lot. So we're talking about equality versus equity versus justice. So in the upper left, we see inequality, that is unequal access to opportunities. So the slide to the right, we're talking about equality. So when we give everyone we evenly distribute the tools and assistance. You can see in that image, the one person is still not getting e truly equal access because they are in a different place. They're coming from a different set of needs. So they still aren't getting sort of the fair share of the apples. Equity is when we customize the tools and services we provide to address the inequality. Often that's referred to as fairness. And um, this can be a real sticking point because some people see some people as getting more than them without understanding the context and how some people, they come from different backgrounds and they have different needs. So equity is what we, we are sort of currently aiming for a lot, but more and more, we're starting to talk about justice. So justice is taking it even further and fixing the system itself to offer equal access to both tools and opportunities, not at the end, but sort of in the beginning. So how, when we start to think about doing something, how can we design in equity, in justice into the system so that everyone has um, the tools they need to be successful? So sort of that's how I think of equality versus equity. Equality is evenly, everybody gets the tools and you hope it works for you. Equity is the unique tools you need to achieve success in the same way that is measured by other, um, as you're measuring success. That came out awkwardly. <laughs> I don't think I'm gonna add more words to that. <laughs> so I'm wondering if you guys want to throw it in the chat or if somebody felt like they wanted to talk about it a little, um, if any examples of equality, equity versus justice, and I know there's some that come right to the top of my head and a lot of them can be really politically charged, but hopefully we won't get too into that. Um, 
but what an example of equity might be versus equality. So I actually had this conversation with um, our junior nursing students yesterday in the clinical setting, talking about a particular patient scenario and talking about access to health care and issues with access to health care and helping students to understand how the issues of inequality and equality and equity have an impact on people's access to health care that it's not their necessarily their choices mm. you know that they all want access but the problem is our system and trying to help the students understand exactly what you're showing. I'm, I'm like, I want to share this slide with my group from yesterday because I think it would clear some things up for them. Mm -hmm. That's why I like this. I think it, it lays things out really clearly and it adds that critical notion of justice because we can keep propping up people, but without fixing the systems and the systemic inequality, it's, it's inefficient and we're not actually fixing any problems. I'm thinking of access like, even if we all get universal health care, if you live in an incredibly rural place where you don't have physical access to health care, that's, that's equality, but it's not equity because you still can't get to a doctor. Um, so we might have to, you know, use our systems of judge justice to leverage, you know, how we can, you know, incentivize health care in rural communities through reworking the whole system. Um, that just sprung to mind. So. Yes, um, I will be sharing this slide out. Um, this slideshow will go out to you guys. You feel free to use it um, to cut and paste, you know, um, do, yeah, if you'd like to take any of this for your, your own use, or if you want more resources, please contact us and we can tell you where we got it. Although we, we did put in a lot of resources at the end, if you want to go further down these rabbit holes. Does anybody else want to mention anything about the slide or have anything they'd like to share in the moment? All right, we're gonna keep moving then. So we wanted to get you guys, you folks thinking about the frustrations. So we all experience frustrations in the workplace and some are interpersonal conflicts. We have time management issues, but there are, there are barriers to work that everyone faces. Um, and everyone has unique barriers to work based on sort of your diverse backgrounds and, and, and what you come to the table with and what you have available to you. So we've, we've especially learned about this in the last year, which how could I possibly talk about anything without talking about the last year and the, the barriers that you feel like you could have been reasonably accommodated for if you had the ability. Um, now I'm, I'm not critiquing the School of Nursing, I'm sure it's wonderfully um, supportive, but you know we all have those things, whether they be, I wish I had my standing desk at home because my back hurts from sitting in the chair all day. Or, um, you know, before the big shove, we didn't have flex scheduling. And now we do. And it turns out that was a huge barrier for a lot of people to be able to work either on their time when they work best to accommodate their, their children's needs. Um, the big shove has actually helped us a lot to see those barriers, but also to start to overcome them in a really big way. Oh, and something, it's Amy. Um, scheduling is always such a tricky thing in the school of nursing because um, people have just crazy schedules between teaching and clinical work and trying to find a time that we can get students together is very challenging and often concerns me that we're leaving folks out along the way. And I, you know, we all try and we struggle to make the best um, plans, but it, it's, I don't know, I often, I often think about that, like who, who's not able to make it to events that we schedule because, you know, of unanticipated things. Mm -hmm. That's a really good point, Amy. Um, one of the things that I'm going to add in here is that I was an adjunct for a very long time. And working as an adjunct, I was actually teaching remotely. The school that I was working for was six hours away. And so often the meetings were conducted 
on campus, not virtually. And so there's a lot of people who are in the same boat. So we were excluded from the trainings that were so important for so many of us. Um, the, they weren't recorded. There was no Zoom at that point in time. So there was a lot of things. And so what can we, what would have been helpful would have been able, even just to be able to be on the call to hear it. Um, but there's a lot of things that we have noticed. Even our students who are trying to deal with, you know, the, some of them, a lot of our students today are working. And especially in the School of Nursing, like they're definitely trying to manage all of that. And one of the other unique things that I'm also doing is I work with the student athletes who are pigeonholed often into certain curricula because it works with their their athletic schedule and not necessarily with their interests. So what could we do to even help them? All right, now that we're sort of thinking about these problems, um, I wanna talk about why we invited staff here today. Um, so it's always been important for me um, as a person who sort of supports the university. One is that I believe in um, continuity of experience. Um, I believe we're all here to do essentially one thing and it helps everyone stay on the same page and stay focused when sometimes um, as support staff, I completely understand how we get distracted in away from the work of what we do, which is um, to teach students. Um, and I really believe that everyone from top to bottom, there's no one, no support staff that shouldn't be involved in the conversations about how we can best serve students, even if you only interact with them on a minimal basis so that we all understand and are on the same page. But the other thing of why, well, there's inclusion is not just in the classroom. So all the practices we talk about, we actually hope that you would maybe make standard for your interactions with your colleagues. And we'll get into sort of silent disabilities and silent needs later, but everything we say to, about students, we're also saying about colleagues. Now it's true that, you know, maybe your instructional colleagues, because of the nature of the job and the achievement you have achieved, you, you've managed to, or are skilled at certain things, but that's not everyone. So we're gonna talk about simple things you can do to make the entire culture of the School of Nursing um, more inclusive for everyone. So when I talk about continuity of experience, I'm talking about the continuity of experience the students have from the first moment they're looking at the website as you know, thinking about joining and participating in the School of Nursing, to filling out forms, to interacting with you know, staff and registers and this and that. They are all having an, a, an experience with the School of Nursing that's not just in the classroom. And so if the culture of the School of Nursing is inclusive on every level, it is just, it's just gonna feel, it's gonna be a better environment for everyone. So it's a, sort of a reminder that the students are learning, maybe not the grad students, but everyone's learning how to sort of, they call it adult, as they go through college. There's that huge, like, how do I manage my time? How do I interact professionally? How do I fill out forms and supply them by deadlines? Um, so by including inclusive practices, we, we help them along in that. Um, the, I'm not going to read this because it's way too much, but John Dewey is um, um, an educational um, science specialist from back in the day. Um, he's still very highly regarded, but he talks about something called social control. Um, social control are the agreed upon rules of society that benefit those in society. So we all sort of, it, it, his example is like a kickball game. Um, sort of everyone agrees on how those rules are played and that way everyone can play them in the same level. Um, right now we're seeing a lot of strife because we, our social control, our agreed upon rules of play in larger society are starting to be questioned and broken down and argued with and we have a lot of chaos um, and that's an uncomfortable place for everyone to be. I'm sure <laughs> we're all, we all are aware of that. And this is where I'd argue that it would be a good idea for 
a simple set of policies to be agreed upon so that everyone understands the expectations and everybody has the same kind of like experience and everyone can feel supportive. And the message that that gives everyone who interacts with and participates in the School of Nursing is a message of inclusion. And it can be really simple things. We just have these standards. When you make a PowerPoint, it has to, you have to run it through, you know, accessibility checker. Always have closed captioning on where possible. Um, and if we agree on those rules, we help to move that justice forward and that equity. And it says something to new faculty who might be interviewing the expectations, right? And it's just, it's a great, um, it's a great thing to have is to have sort of policies to agree upon that social control. That's the science behind it. All right, just a couple quick facts for you. Um, so this came from the uh, CDC and the National Center for Educational Statistics. This is a very asterisk statistic um, because it is very hard to collect this data, but we approximately 19% of students report disabilities and one in four adults are living, living with disabilities. So that's a very high number. Um, that's just everybody we interact with all the time. I wonder if you think about how many students report disabilities to you in your classes. And I wonder if it's 19% of your students because they're there. <laughs> um, so this just highlights the importance of creating inclusive practices because a lot of people don't report it. In fact, um, almost 60% of students who self-identify in their first year do not continue to identify. So something happens that first year in their experience with identifying that dissuade them. And this literature talks about social problems. They're sort of excluded. They're made to feel like an other. Um, it is difficult to constantly advocate for yourself. It is exhausting, in fact. And these students aren't advocating for themselves once. Like K-12 would get an IEP and that IEP would follow them. They don't have to re-advocate for themselves every year with every instructor. The students do. Um, it's a little easier for staff because we have a sort of continuous workplace. So generally, once you advocate for yourself, it becomes a standard, but you still, you do constantly have to act, have to advocate. Um, so it's, it's exhausting and it's difficult because remember, they're not just advocating for themselves to you, but to every single one of their instructors every single semester, right? Negotiating how to get their needs met. One of the big things, Rebecca, is um, and part of the research is that even though we're seeing that part of the data that you just showed was that about 25% of adults are roaming around with some kind of a disability or difference. Uh, in higher education, it's less than 10% from the research I've done that actually self-identify. And of those 10%, <clears throat> one of the problems that Rebecca was just mentioning has to do with them not only having to go through the process of getting the paperwork, but in a lot of cases, they've never actually been identified. So a lot of students who have um, even differences like ADHD or ADD, um, they, in order for them to get that um, diagnosis can be thousands of dollars out of pocket. And so it prohibits them from actually going forward. Um, you know, so, so there's that. And of course, there's the stigma that's attached to it. So what are people going to think about me? And that's one of the biggest reasons why they don't want to self-identify. And students who um, tend to have these issues when they're in high school, you know, that once they get to um, college, they think, oh, I, I can do it on my own. I don't need any help. They, it's like a pride thing as well. And they don't, they're worried that people are going to think less of them. And so it's a bigger issue um, for them to even come forward, let alone for them to even be able to get the qualifications um, that, that goes along with it. And a lot of the time it's just extra, extra time or quiet space. And that's quite often not what they need. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm. They absolutely so that you know the the clinical work expectations and and also people who you know are applying for jobs staff they don't want to identify because they don't want to be automatically sort of kicked down um, or you know 
Yes, that's true. Accommodations from high school aren't always applied the same in the, at the college level. So for sure, there's no quick fix for this. I think it, it's worth having conversations. Um, Michelle and I were brainstorming how great it would be if once a student identified as a freshman, that information would just be automatically, automatically shared with every instructor when they sign up for a class. So they, you know, it's sort of like they opt in, opt out of um, organ donation. Um, that's true, I'm gonna talk about that in a second, Janice. But um, it would be so much easier if once they identified, they didn't have to advocate for themselves. If the instructor just got a note, you have a student, it could even be an anonymous note. You have a student in this class that has these special needs. Here are some recommendations for accommodation. Do you guys think that that would be useful for you if you, you got a notice, even if you didn't know who the student was, if it was just automatically told with maybe supports put in place so that you could click on a link and figure out what to do rather than figure it out for yourself? So I have an example of that just in real life in general. I have an airborne peanut allergy. So anybody fly, <laughs> go anywhere, anywhere there's peanuts in general. Every time I go anywhere, I have to make sure that, it, especially if I'm flying, I have to let them know ahead of time. The problem with that is that now not all airlines are very compliant about it. Sometimes they'll let you board a little bit ahead of time and clean things up, but they won't, um, they won't restrict what their passengers are, are having. And when you have an airborne anaphylactic allergy like that, it's, you often don't have a choice in how you get around, right? Like, I mean, if you've got to get, you know, you just don't have that choice. If they just had a policy that was, you know, please don't do this or what, it would make it a lot easier for so many of us who are in that particular, you know, situation. The same thing applies in our classrooms. You know, you had a, a student who has a visual impairment make things a little bit better for everybody. It benefits everybody. Reading. Thanks, Elizabeth, for sharing that. UB accessi accessibility resources are great. We do work with them quite a bit. Um, mm -hmm. I also agree with Janice that it's not clear enough for students and what to do. I just feel like it's it's not it's not easy enough. There are too many barriers for getting good services for the students and for faculty to get the information they need. And that we could maybe identify a few things um, to make it a little bit easier for everyone. Um, it should be noted, these statistics are brought up because whether or not, and I'm sure you know this, the students are identified, they are in your class now. Um, they are in this meeting. We all have different needs and hard, have barrier to access all of our colleagues. So, we're sort of trying to pitch these inclusive practices that just should be standard because they help everyone. I wanna say when we refer students to student services, um, all they tell the students are that, well, you gotta go see your doctor and get the documentation. That is, that's it. That is all they do. Once the students have that letter, you know, then they really uh, will advocate for the student but then again, they're only open from nine to five. So we have students who need extended time for testing. Um, they're not available. Students have to change their times around accessibility, uh, the accessibility office hours. So, and, and we know we've had students who we know have had problems, but accessibility resources does not help them to get the documentation that they need in order to access those resources. And that's where the gap is for these students. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So instead of sort of passively waiting for this to come to you, we're going to pitch some practices that are supportive, even if a student can't get a diagnosis, because they're in a gray area where it maybe just doesn't qualify quite enough, or you have a colleague who just needs a little, you know, just operates better 
under certain circumstances. So um, as just standard practices, it helps, they help. E exactly, right? Equality instead of equity. They, they have a tendency to sort of have a certain set of tools and just throw those at them. Well, maybe they don't need more time. Maybe they need something totally different. Maybe they need, you know. So yes, it's not necessarily equity that's coming out. Not to mention that there's a lot of cases where things happen and we don't even realize, like students may not even realize that there is something wrong or something that is uh, affecting them. And it could be a temporary thing instead of something that is more permanent. Like, you know, we, it, how many of us have ever broken something, broken a bone or gotten sick or, you know, uh, this whole year? Anything can happen in an instant. And, you know, people don't always know where to go. And again, it goes back to the comment that I made earlier about, about the um, ridiculous cost that it is for them to even try to navigate a system and the, the, um, just the, the cost involved with trying to pay for some of these things. They may or may not even you know, show that they have a problem, depending on who they go see. Mm -hmm. I, I like that you brought up the problem might be temporary because not every need is permanent and forever. This last year, we've had a lot more need, you know, we've all been under so much more stress and unknown. So we all needed more support, which is temporary. So the idea of getting an IEP and going to the accessibility office is not really feasible for a situation. And we all have like students who have, like she said, an accident, they have a loved one die. You know, we've all had that experience. They just need a little bit extra help for a short time until they get back up on their feet. So that would be equity, right? Allowing that one student to have, to take their test a week later or turn in their paper late or something like that. Um, Michelle, do you wanna talk about this slide? Cause it's your slide. Yeah, so um, Sue Man Dolce, who is over in accessibility resources, she and she's great. Um, her and I have been talking about an awful lot of things. and. Something that she said to me was, these were actually things that she said to me about the things that people who come to their office would like everyone to know about those who live with disability. Um, and that, you know, these are, these are some key points is that they are important and they do contribute to our community, not just UB, but in general, um, and they wanna be included. And this is a, a big thing is sometimes people will look down at them and all they will exclude them. You know, here's everybody. If you thought about it, you know, if everybody was sitting in a wheelchair, you wouldn't know which person actually needed it. Right. So something about it being really mindful and including them as well. And don't assume that people just because they have um, an accommodation that they're not capable of trying they're all more than capable of doing whatever it is. Everybody is here because they want to learn and they want to get somewhere. And just because they have um, a difference doesn't mean that they shouldn't, that they're not capable. Um, and a lot of the disabilities are invisible. Um, again, you know, how many of us have like chronic migraines, um, you know, different kinds of other issues, mental health issues, all of those types of things that we just can't see. Not everything is visible. Um, people who have cognitive difference, you can't always tell that. And um, how we treat the students, how we treat each other, it truly, it matters a lot because that's the thing that lasts. So those are the key things that she really wants people to know about when you're dealing with people who have these accessibility, when they, especially when they come with a notification that they've got an accessibility need, but those are the few that can come forward. All right, enough of our, our motivation, right? <laughs> Hopefully, <laughs> I'm sure that you all came in knowing why we should do this, but our pitch is over. So now we are gonna briefly talk about sort of approaches and actions. We tried to pick what we call low-hanging fruit, um, something that is stuff that is relatively easy for you to incorporate. Because um, uh, whenever we talk about changing anything, we talk about micro changes um, and creating a momentum. Uh, so small things we can do. Um, whoa, that slide got a little. That was not what that looked like when I, oh, all right. <laughs> it's the Canva Hopefully, PowerPoint thing. No, we, we, we built this in a we built this in a non-accessible format and then converted it to an accessible format. And I would have sworn this was fine yesterday when I saw it. It was fine even earlier. <laughs> even earlier. Oh, wow. Well, what are you going to do? Okay. 
So design matters. <laughs> um, so the main thing we're gonna we're gonna talk about universal design. M maybe most of you have heard of universal design for learning, which is one offshoot of universal design. But you know, let me pull my notes out really quick. Um, yeah, that is mm. universal design is simply designing as best as we can for everyone. Um, does universal design is not about meeting accessibility regulations. Um, it's not about what do they tell us we have to do and that's what we're gonna do. Universal design is starting in the beginning um, because um, accessibility design regulations, um, I have a quote here, they create an illusion that only people with disabilities need increased usability and safety, which is wrong. We all need increased usability and safety, not just people with identified disabilities. Um, the increased usability and safety benefits everyone in the community. So it's that, you know, a rising tide lifts all the boats. Um, everyone benefits from better practices and design practices. Consider something like this. How many people here are left-handed? Anybody left-handed in the group? So if, right. <laughs> so if you're left-handed, how it's, it's an incredibly difficult thing to try and do everything. If every single pro product that you're using is for right-handed people, anybody ever damaged their right hand if they're right hand dominant and had to use their left hand? Yep. I dislocated my thumb when I was uh, in seventh grade and had to use my left hand for everything after that. And it's amazing how it changes everything that you're doing. So if we think about the design of that, just from a very basic place, if you're thinking about the use of, of anything that we're doing, can your mouse be used? Um, right now, my mouse is a right-handed mouse. So if I were to click on the right tab, right, I'm going to get the right click. It's going to mess me up a little bit because I'm going to get the wrong thing. So thinking about the way that you're designing things, to be inclusive just at that very level. Mm -hmm. So probably the most common example of this is cut curbs. So they're required to cut curbs for disability access, but it helps everyone, right? It helps um, people who have mobility issues. It helps mothers with strollers. It helps people on bikes who maybe shouldn't be using the sidewalk, but do anyway, because the road is crazy. It helps you know, little kids who, who are navigating steps, like that simple design improves the quality of everyone. If, if they design a building so that you don't have to go upstairs to access it, it helps everyone versus putting in a ramp that's sort of around the corner at the end. Um, yes, Amy, I went to Costa Rica and I was, the change there, I was like, you just can't navigate there. Like it's not, cause it's not a culture of accessibility and inclusivity when it comes to physical in, in the urban areas I was in. And I was sort of shocked at how inclusive we are and how uninclusive and how much, how difficult it must be for people to navigate. Cause I didn't see anyone there who had a visible physical disability. Um, and it, it's sort of surprising. Um, so, Universal design is basically, I'm gonna read something which is not ideal, but it'll be in our slide notes. Um, um, we design and compose the environment so that may be accessed, understood and used to the greatest possible extent in the most independent and natural manner possible in the widest possible range of situations without the need for adaptation, modification, assistive devices, specialized solutions by people of any size age or particular physical, sensory, mental health or disability. So it's designed to be used well by everyone so you don't have to come back after the fact and add in accommodations. So there's a whole field called universal design for learning that addresses learning in particular, but universal design talks about everything from physical spaces, the things you interact with in your household, technology, everything. Um, we have a really, really great center here at UB called the IDEA Center, I-D-E-A. Um, and they actually work with outside companies to universally design 
products. Um, it's on South Campus, it's huge. Um, they are, uh, um, last time I was there, they had a bus because a bus company had hired them to universally design buses. So they had a, they have a huge lab and they built, they had like different buses that they literally built and they invited people of all kinds to come in and test it. Um, and it's a really fascinating um, place and the work they do is really, really neat. That is more physical design, um, but there's also universal design for learning, which is um, important when you're developing coursework and working with students. All right, actionable items. What can you do today? So most of these items I, are easily translatable to classroom and instructional practices also. Um, inclusive meeting practices, distributing the materials in advance, right? So, you know, having an agenda and if you're gonna have handouts, if you're gonna have anything, give people a chance to look over them in advance. Same with your students. I would argue, unless it's a test, there's almost no reason to hide your content from your students. Um, share questions to be discussed. So this is great, especially in the classroom, if you have a, a, if you have a particular cohort that is reticent to speak, English language, secondary English language learners or just shy people, if you tell them ahead of time, we're gonna be discussing A, B, and C, they have time to think about what they're gonna say and how to prep. Um, create space after the meeting for discussion. Often people want to share ideas, but maybe they need more time to sort of create coherent arguments. They just, they need, they're not quick thinkers, you know, they mull over stuff. So you're going to have more success if you allow that discussion to move offline. And this can be the same in the classroom. If you move the classroom discussion into a discussion board and sort of say, okay, let's take that even farther. Um, it allows those students who are not comfortable, maybe they don't have the technology to be able to participate fully. So the last one is really a whole thing. And it took me a while to figure out how to even coalesce it into a sentence. Um, but it's that the meeting leaders need to actively orchestrate what happens in the meeting. Um, that means when people talk over each other, when people repeat other people's ideas, that we make sure that there's equity in the class, in, in not just the classroom, because it does happen in the classroom. You all know that, right? You have the people who want to contribute a lot and the people who never contribute and people who talk over other people. As meeting leaders, as instructors, it's critically important um, that you orchestrate and manage those discussions. And I'm sure that you all know this as instructors, but that has to happen in meetings too. And we've all experienced that. And it's political and it's complicated. <laughs> but um, recognizing people when they're talking and making sure that they are not talked over is very important. All right, does anybody have anything they wanna say about maybe other practices or issues they're having understanding or how they could incorporate or? Um, so most of us, I, I believe, have heard of microaggressions. So these are the small things that happen to you that are aggressive, <laughs> bad, <laughs> right? There's a video going around about a, well, it's a, a meeting where a, you know, council representative refuses to acknowledge that the woman who asked to be called a doctor, he calls her by her first name and she says that's doctor. And he continues to call her by her first name despite her correcting. Um, how she wants to be called. And that's, you know, there are microaggressions that happen to all of us all the time. So what they recommend is instead of punishing people who commit microaggressions to really change the culture of conversation is to model micro affirming practices. And sort of instead of saying, please don't do that, you know, if you come in modeling these practices, that social control, we change the rules of the game. So making sure we use uh, pronunciations of names and pronouns 
And often this means, this can look like taking the time to, when you have students who have names that are difficult to pronounce, taking the time and really saying, hang on, I wanna make sure that I pronounce this correctly. You know, that is very affirming um, for everyone, right? Um, making sure that you can even ask people about pronouns, but if you ask people about pronouns, you have to ask everybody about pronouns and it has to be a practice and not a one-off. Um, recognizing and validating experiences. Um, so taking the time to literally say, when someone tells a story, you know, to recognize their experience and validate it as true and not to argue against it because um, everyone's experience is valid. Another one which kind of goes back to the other meeting stuff is asking people for their opinions. So when you have students or people in meetings who are not contributing, giving them the opportunity and letting them know their opinion is valid. Michelle, you have a unique perspective. I'd really like to hear your perspective on this, but not calling out, let's say people of color to be the representative of their race and do that emotional work. So making sure everyone has a chance to talk and recognizing, hey, because you know, everybody's been in that meeting where you get shut down and then you're like, I'm not even participating more. No one cares what I have to say. So if you are in that situation where you can say, you know what, you know, Rebecca, I, we haven't heard from you and you always have a great you know, perspective on this. Can, can you help contribute? Because you're, you're valid and your perspective is valid. Um, publicly recognizing the achievements of others. So this can be a small thing as like, Michelle, that was a great point. Or, um, you know, talking about Amy and her, her experience with her elderly father um, and asking her to talk and, and rec recognizing the achievements and the perspective of others. Um, it's really important. And I, I don't know how, I feel like it's not done enough, but, and then active listening. So listening, making eye contact, engaging, giving feedback, um, that's affirming. You know, if, and we, you guys all know because you probably give lectures online where there's no active listening. You're just at black, black screens, right? And it's so difficult. You feel like you're not doing anything and no one's listening and you're not important. So these are all little tiny things you can do that are micro affirming and help them change the culture. Last slide here. Um, so adopting inclusive standards using technology. So what we've done here with always turning on closed captioning. Um, that's a real low hanging fruit, recording your sessions and your meetings, making them available afterward for people to review. Um, great for everybody. Um, you know, recording your teaching instruction to let to, so that the students can go back and revisit it. Maybe they missed something. Maybe they need to explain it again. Maybe they can't keep up with how fast you're speaking or they get tripped up on complex words and sort of academic jargon that happened. These other three things are actually links to how to's. So how to create accessible documents in Word. Um, most, we, we use Word a ton um, and it's relatively simple to incorporate uh, the practices of using like the templates in Word. I'm not gonna lie, PowerPoint presentations can be hairy. <laughs> I spent an hour correcting this one, um, but it's also because I use Canva and Canva does not have accessibility checkers. Um, they don't have anything for that. So I did that and translated it into PowerPoint. And if I had just built it into the template that I already have, that I use all the time, which is already accessible, I, 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 may, I give myself a harder job but it's not too tough to do that. Um, and once it becomes a standard practice for meetings, for teaching, for whatever. This IT accessibility checklist is a little bit more complex, but it's about when you decide to incorporate technology, software, hardware, whatever, things you should be thinking about beyond does it cost any money? Um, and that can get a little bit more complicated, but is it still important? Do they have a VPAP? Do they, you know, how, how does it work well with the most common assistive devices? Um, yes. 
I'm going to just read what Amy had to say. If you notice at the bottom of your Zoom panel now, there's an option there for the live transcription that as the host of the meeting, you can turn that on. It's actually, I've had it running the whole time here. It's actually a really great thing to use, especially for people who, who need that, but it's not just people who are hearing impaired or, you know, it's people who have, my daughter, for example, has um, central auditory processing disorder. So she, what she hears on the left is not what she processes on the right. Uh, some people also, they're, they're non-native English speakers. So they're trying to learn the language and see the spelling of words. And it just helps upload a lot of the complicated things. And even, you know, some of our presenters are non-native English speakers. So we're trying to also understand what they're saying as well. So it helps upload a lot of that information at the same time. And then also think about what also happens. Sometimes um, we have our volume turned down so we can read that. And it, it really does, um, especially if there's a lot of noise, which will happen in my house, especially these days. But those things are just little things that we can do to make things easier. And it's something that's on Zoom. Uh, the Panopto um, live, if you're doing like the live webinar, uh, the live streaming doesn't have that option right now. Um, and I think WebEx is coming, but for Zoom, it is here right now already. Mm -hmm. So the pronouns conversation is really interesting. Um, so I am of the always pronouns or never pronouns. Um, because often what we do is we only do sort of pronoun recognition when we re when we think someone might need it, when there is maybe a transgendered person and that singles them out because if we only do that, when, when there's a visible transgendered person, a person we clock, but there are, that, that's not necessarily true. There are um, non-binary people um, that present certain ways. Um, so on, on micro affirmation could be just always including it. Just, I put it my signature in Zoom, I put it my signature here, but also slowly starting to adjust your language to non-gendered language. And this is something I've been working on for probably two years and I still mess up, but instead of saying, hi guys, you say, hey folks, um, you know, and, and it just takes practice. Um, but it's, I think just, it's a micro affirmation and it doesn't hurt anybody. Um, you know, it, it does take a little bit of work, but you know, when I write emails, I just make sure that I'm not unnecessarily using gender when I don't have to, um, yeah, so. I, 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 it has taken a while because you do have to shift your language. Um, so give yourself the benefit of the doubt when you mess up all the time, <laughs> which I do. Um, all right. Um, so we've included the UDL guidelines, which are really, really great. Universal Design for Learning talks about giving people opportunities um, in a variety of ways to both interact with material. Well, Michelle, actually, you've got it in your head. I know you do. <laughs> what are the three buckets of UDL? It's representation, um, expression, and then uh, I think it's engagement. So it's it's those. How are we thinking about things? It's the who, who, why, and and like uh, when of things, all of those things, the what of how we're processing whatever it is, and what can we do to make things a little bit better, whether it's a visual thing, whether it's a physical thing, whether it's the way that we're communicating, whether we're giving them choice and how people respond to whatever it is. So in terms of when you're thinking about communication, um, you know, Right now, the the thing that I, I think um, as a as an instructor, the thing that I've noticed now is that when I would have office hours before, almost none of my students would ever come. And I'm talking to a lot of my my uh, you know friends who are also um, instructors in the same thing, like they would never come. And now when they have a choice of meeting on Zoom or whichever you know platform, 
it's so much better. So giving people the choice of how would you like to communicate? Would you like me to just, would you like to trade emails? Would you like to meet on Zoom? Would it be better for us to meet in person somehow? Um, even text, some people are better on that. So even having like a little chat space. Sometimes it's just those little things. Thinking about the environment, same type of a thing. Where are you meeting? Do you need a quieter space? Do you need a large, like what is it that you need? The technology, are you using, are, are you able to use whatever it is on your phone? Does it have to be on a computer? Does it have to be on a Mac environment, a PC environment? Is it on a tablet, um, an, uh, you know, an Apple device? What is it that you're using and can it be used in different ways? If you're asking them to do presentations, like Rebecca did this one in Canva, which is such a nice uh, switch from using PowerPoint. It just visually has, an, has a different appeal to it. But, you know, what are you comfortable with and allowing your, you know, everyone to have do what they need to do as long as as long as they're getting that task completed, but in a way that um, appeals to them as well. Mm -hmm. One of the examples I like to use here, I have that Starbucks cup is so Starbucks writes your name on the cup and says your name out loud, right? There's two modalities of information being it's the same information being conveyed two different ways. But that way, people who have sight issues or they have reading issues or whatever, or auditory issues can get the same piece of information. So that's what we think of. Um, I think of, um, yeah, if you, if you provide the reading and you do, and you're like, and here's a video about it, and we're going to have a class discussion about it. So they're kind of getting it in three different ways. If they, they read it easier, if a video is easier, um, yeah, Zoom is less intimidating and they don't have to go as far. We have that same thing. We meet, it's easier for us to meet with instructors when we can just both, it just lowers the barrier. So we're not talking about incorporating new things that are huge list. We're just, how can we eliminate barriers, identify and eliminate barriers that we're getting in our way? Sort of way back at the beginning of this presentation, we talked about those frustrations that you run into, those little barriers. Like, how can I, how can I do this better? Um, how can I make this easier for students and for my colleagues? So it's really about that, lowering the barriers um, to instruction. Thinking about even right now, what is the one of the biggest barriers of being um, at UB is just the travel, <laughs> trying to find parking, trying to get from one campus to the other, to one office to another, especially when you're, you know, if you might be on the medical campus and then you have to go to a meeting that's on North campus and then you've got to go over to South campus, it's so much easier to just do things on, you know, via Zoom because we're a lot more efficient that way and not trying to figure out parking. I mean, I, I can't tell you the number of times I was late for a meeting um, and I spent, you know, 45 minutes looking for a parking spot. And then, you know, trying to just walk from there to where I needed to be. And, you know, you plan your time you know, so trying to be more efficient as well. Mm -hmm. um, one I liked was um, often there'll be presentations required from students um, for a class where the objective is not public speaking. So they, they, they have to do a presentation in front of everyone, but that's not actually an objective of the class. And I would always suggest, well, why not let them do their presentation not in front of everybody? And then everybody can just watch each other's videos because there's a barrier of presenting in front of people. And if that's not a part of what they're actually supposed to be learning in class, and it's not a part of the content area, it lowers the barrier for students because they don't have an audience staring at them. And then the other students don't have to sit there passively and watch. They can engage with that material on their own time. Um, so it's like I said, it's limiting the barriers of access and identifying what could be holding the students up, what could be holding the colleagues up, how can I make make it more accessible and easier to get to that, what we're actually trying to do, which is learn or collaborate and work together and get stuff done. Um, so we have a lot more information. Um, I found this article that was really fascinating on the influence of micro affirmations on undergraduate persistence. So how microaggressions can actually add up and be part of the reason why students are not able to complete a program. Um, we've got universal design for learning guidelines, the inclusive teaching toolkit. Um, these are all designed to help. Um, they're, they're all pretty straightforward. 
Um, they give you a lot of really practical ideas for how to start to incorporate accessibility and inclusivity. The, um, that, yeah, yeah, the, uh, this one, you know, the Universal Design for Learning Resources right here is a document. It's a shared document between the UB Libraries and the Western New York Libraries Association. And it's a live document with so many great resources. And they're asking, you know, if you want to use it, you want to add to it, go right ahead. It's a great thing. It's a Google Doc. And so I added that in there, I attended a presentation from them recently, and it was fabulous. So they've shared that out. And so I've included that here as well. Um, so in what might be the most amazing piece of planning ever, this is my last slide and it's one o'clock. <laughs> I would like to say I planned that because I'm that good. <laughs> Meg is laughing really hard there. <laughs> I should take credit, but I can't do it. Like, that's just a coincidence. <laughs> so this is a part where we can kind of segue. I think we had a, we have like a half hour, an hour planned in. It can be what you guys want. Um, Amy can clarify exactly how much time we have, but where we could have a discussion, where we could problem solve, um, especially as a group, you guys, you guys know your content area the best and sort of best practices. And we could possibly share I'm have this trouble, what's a solution? And and we can sort of open it up. So now. something that something that um has kind of just come 